Hey, welcome to Walking with Jesus. This is episode 85. Today we're going to be taking a look at James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. All right, let's dive right in. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. All right, so just out of the gate, this is probably some of the best advice um, in our every day-to-day living that, uh, that, we can, that we can take, right? So James here um, says to us that we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Now, this is immediately applicable to all of us in any situation that we find ourselves in, whether it's our marriage, um, dealing with our kids, in our relationships with coworkers, um, even strangers that we encounter. You know, so much of our frustration and the interactions that we have with other people, they come as a result of our insecurities, but more than that, um, our expectations, and in addition to our expectations, things that we assume, right? Our assumptions. So here, James says that to avoid all of that, we need to slow our roll. In other words, we need to slow down and uh, we need to really listen to what people are saying. Now, when we listen, that doesn't mean just hearing words so that we have the ability to say what we want to in response. I don't know about you, but I can be pretty guilty of that, where I'm in a conversation and maybe it's getting heated because we don't necessarily see eye to eye on the thing that we're talking about. And so here I am, I'm hearing them, but I'm not listening to them. Because if I'm listening to someone, I'm actually taking in what they're saying and I'm processing it, but I'm processing it for the purpose of really truly understanding what they're trying to convey. So sometimes when we're talking to people, we can uh, get our words a little bit jumbled up, especially if we are feeling a little bit tense or excitable in the moment. And so the words that we say may not actually convey the message that we're trying to convey. And so if I'm really truly listening to someone, if I'm gonna slow down and I'm going to listen, well, then I'm going to ask questions, I'm going to verify, I'm gonna confirm, I'm gonna make sure that I understand what they're saying. So this says that we should be, slow, that we should be quick to listen. So listening should be our go-to. In every situation that we find ourselves, listening should be the thing that we practice the most. I mean, you've probably heard the old adage, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so you should listen twice as much as you talk. Well, there's wisdom in that. And wisdom is simply the proper application of knowledge. So we want to be quick to listen. And by listening, what we mean by that is we're really seeking to understand what the other person is saying. That does not mean that we're seeking to agree with them. It just means that we want to understand what it is that they are trying to say. And if we have questions, we're going to ask questions. However, we should be slow to speak. In other words, we should be slow to respond or to react. This gets us in all kinds of trouble. And a lot of the times, what we are actually reacting to is not even the words or the message that is being given. We're reacting to tone, we're reacting to body language, or we're reacting just really to our own feelings, our preferences, our wants and desires, maybe even our fears in the situation. So when someone says something to us, bam, we're coming at them immediately. And sometimes we're coming at them just because we have assumed that they're going to say something or or take a certain line of reasoning or a certain certain course of of action. Or maybe they've done something in the past and we're carrying a little bit of uh, bitterness. Maybe we're already angry at this person or we've already had the conversation inside of our head. 
Do you ever do that? Where you know you're going to have a confrontation and most people hate confrontation. So before you go into the confrontation, you already have the conversation five, six, seven times and you immediately imagine like the worst case scenarios and this huge blow up and then you imagine yourself getting in these like one liners and just like nailing them, right? And so that's incredibly dangerous. So God's word tells us be quick to listen, to really truly seek to hear and to discern what they're wanting to say and then be slow to speak, be slow to react and then it says, and be slow to get angry. When it comes down to anger, a lot of the times, anger is just, it's about us, isn't it? It's, you're not saying something the way I think you should say it, or my ego is incredibly fragile, um, my, uh, my self-perception is a little bit weak, and so I've got to put up these walls, these defenses around myself, and man, I'm going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that you don't make me feel bad, or you don't say something that uh, might take me off course in my own line of thinking. Well, really, that just boils down to insecurity. Like, I, I really don't have to get angry if we're just having a conversation, even if I adamantly disagree with you. I have friends that, you know what, politically, we're on very different, different sides. And uh, logically, I even question, like, how in the world, as a follower of Jesus, can you believe the things that you believe and vote the way that you vote? And that also comes down to other areas besides, besides politics. I have friends who don't believe in God. I have friends that are actually kind of against the idea of who God is. And you know what? That's completely diametrically in opposition to who I am as a person and as a follower of Jesus. But yet, I don't have to become angry at them because really, anger reveals itself as just I'm not in control. And so anger flares up because I want to be in control. I want to dominate. I want things to happen my way right now. And James even speaks to this. He says, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Human anger is based in our flesh. Human, ag- um, human anger is based in our preferences, right? Our desires. I want it to be my way. I want you to see things the way I see them. I want you to do things the way that I do them. And I'm not going to leave any room for us to, to disagree and still love each other. That's not going get to us, get us anywhere. That's not going to help us to grow as people. You know, Back in the day, we used a word, tolerance, or to tolerate. To tolerate simply means that I can occupy space with someone who thinks differently than I do and still enjoy them as a person. Unfortunately, today, we've shifted the goalpost because that's what culture today is all about, is changing definitions of things. And we've made tolerance all about agreement. So you don't tolerate me if you don't agree with me. And if you don't agree with me, then you're a bigot. And we put the term phobic at the end of all of these terms. And really all we're doing that for is because we want to beat people into submission to force them to agree with what we say, feel, and believe. All right. Now, is there an unhuman anger then that does produce the righteousness of God? I believe so. You know, in another place it says, in your anger, do not sin. So I do believe that there's a godly anger. Jesus became angry. Um, There was a time in the temple where he wanted to heal somebody and everybody grew really quiet because it was the Sabbath and they were in opposition to him. And it says he became indignant with them because of their hardened hearts. I mean, obviously there's the famous times in the temple courts where Jesus is flipping tables and uh, chasing the the animals out of the the courtyard and he called it a, a den of thieves. Right? I mean, there was passion. There was anger there. But it says that the, the motivation for that was that the zeal for the house of the Lord had consumed him. So it's that zeal for the things of God that allows us to become angry when things are in opposition to the things of God. And I think that really has to be the dividing line for us between what uh, anger that is genuine and anger that is fleshly. 
So if we become angry because something is breaking the, the commands or breaking the heart of God, I think it's okay to be angry, but we have to be careful where we point that and how we utilize that anger. You know, even when Jesus drove people out of the temple courts, he wasn't beating people. He never used the whip on individuals. He would use the whip to drive the animals. But he wasn't directing his anger at people and, and judging. And again, it comes down to what, is, what does judgment mean? Well, judgment means I'm going to call out the sin, but I'm not going to beat up the sinner. Does that make sense to you? So I'm, I should, as a Christian, call things out that are sinful and that are wrong. I am very angry about abortion. I think abortion is wicked. I think it's disgusting. I believe that it is 100% murder. It's, that's what God's Word says. Now, if someone gets an abortion, am I going to hate them? No. I'm going to love them. I'm going to encourage them to, to seek uh, reconciliation between them and God. And I'm going to try to help them to seek counseling to be able to walk through that so that they can be healed inside. You know, there's all kinds of sinful activities and behaviors and mindsets that are outside the will of God. And I believe it's right and just for us to be angry about the sin because of what it's doing to people, to what it's doing to society. But that's a godly anger. And that anger does not lead us into sin because we don't make it about ourselves. It's when our anger is about us. How dare you say that to me? How dare you call me that? And that we become defensive, and really all of our attitude and all of our energy and strength is going into defending us, and we're making us the center of, of the issue, then that's not helpful. And it doesn't produce the righteousness, the right standing with God that God desires for us to have. It says, so, get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives. Man, that's a huge statement, right? James says, you need to get rid of the filth and the evil. Well, why is that? Why is it that he's, try why is it that he's saying that? I mean, we see this again and again throughout the Scriptures, that we're supposed to be holy, we're supposed to be pure before God. Is it just because God doesn't want us to have any fun? Absolutely not. Again, it comes back to the fact that those things pollute us. Those things influence us, and they lead us away from God and His goodness. And when we're led away from God and His goodness, we are removed from the umbrella of His blessing and that divine protection. And we find ourselves in all kinds of places and situations where we're actually going to become hurt. So here James says, if you don't want to make everything about you, if you want to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, if you don't want to be a self-focused, self-centered person, then work on getting rid of the filth and the evil from your life because it's influencing you toward that behavior. And humbly accept the word God has placed in your heart. Well, how do we humbly accept God's word? We recognize that it's true. And so as I read the scriptures, I don't just say, oh man, that's a really good idea. I say, no, that must become the foundation of my life. And then... I actually pursue it. I actually have a hunger and a desire to explore what God's Word says, to understand its true meaning. Because you know what? We can actually apply this idea to the Word of God. A lot of people start reading the Bible and they come across a passage or an idea that they don't understand. And maybe it offends them because, number one, they made an assumption. Um, number two, they just don't have understanding of the culture. They don't really get what it's saying. Or number three, it's just so far removed from us, it doesn't make any sense. And so they say, ah, I'm not going to keep reading this thing. Like, it's just, it's too much for me. I don't like this. I'm going to move on. Well, they didn't try to listen. They didn't try to understand. They didn't dig deeper. They were quick to react. And then it drove them into a place of anger. They made it about themselves. You see what I'm saying there? So we can even do this with God's word. But here, it says that we must humbly accept the Word in our heart because it has the power to save our souls. What is our soul? Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotion. So as we humbly accept God's Word, as we allow it to come into our lives, as we pursue it, and we truly, genuinely seek to understand it, it has this regenerating effect. 
In Romans 12, it says that God's Word will renew our minds. It has the power to wash us clean, and it will sanctify us. It will help us to become more and more like Jesus. So our mind, the way that we think, our will, our desires, and our emotions, how we feel, they can come more and more to alignment with God's Word, but only if we humbly accept that it is true, that it is good, and that it's right. That's how we move beyond a belief to a conviction. And it's only when we have a conviction that we'll actually move forward in that direction to apply it to our lives. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, oh, please help us to apply Your Word in every area of our life. Lord, please help us to be quick to listen, to seek understanding and clarification. Help us to be slow to react, to speak, and help us, Lord, to be slow to become angry. Help us, Lord, not to make everything about us, but Lord, help us to receive Your Word with humility and recognize that it is true and the, and the, and the genuine foundation for our lives. And Lord, help us. Help us to become more and more like Jesus as Your Word brings clarity and purpose and meaning and value and renewal to us. Lord, as You save our souls, we thank You that our salvation is in Jesus alone and we receive that in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Well, hey, I hope 